started. So welcome again to our Freshwater Stewardship Community Webinar Series. We're very excited to have Alejandro here with us today. He's going to be our keynote presenter. And then we also have two Watersheds Canada staff. My name is Nicole. I'm the Freshwater Health Coordinator. And we also have Jane, who's the Digital Engagement Technician. And if you're having, having any tech issues throughout the presentation, feel free to send Jane a private message and she will help you out. And now a little bit about Watersheds Canada. Watersheds is a nonprofit and charitable organization based in Perth, Ontario. We deliver programs across the country in partnership with landowners, community groups, and students who are looking to take action to protect their local freshwater. So you can see on our screen, we have some photos of our different programs. So on the top left, we have our Natural Edge program where we work with landowners to naturalize their property using native plants. And then on the bottom left, we have our Love Your Lake program, which is delivered in partnership with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. And it's a shoreline evaluation program where we fill out an assessment for each property and the property owners get a custom recommendations for voluntary actions that they can, they can take to help protect their lake. And then finally, on the right hand side, we have our fish habitat restoration program. And in the photo, you can see a brush bundle, brush bundle which is woody debris that we add to the lake. Um, to add habitat for the wildlife and to improve the water quality. So if you have any questions about those programs, feel free to drop them in the chat, or you can also send us an email about that. And we're all here today because of our Freshwater Stewardship Community, which is an online community that is connecting people from across the country. So we have over 1300 members that are already a part of this community, and it's been going on for over a year now. All of the webinars and handouts that we've created have been archived on our website, which is watersheds.ca slash freshwater dash stewardship. So I'd encourage you to check them out today after today. Um, we've got webinars from the private sector, other nonprofits and academia, which cover a wide range of topics that all have to do with freshwater health. And then we'd also like to thank the Peterborough KM Hunter Charitable Foundation and the SM Blit Blair Family Foundation for their funding support this year. And now to introduce our speaker. Alejandro is a wildlife photographer who loves nothing more than spending early mornings exploring local lakes, rivers, and forests, trying to capture the elegance of the animal kingdom on camera. When not in the field, Alejandro spends his time educating the public about the art of wildlife photography through his blog, APC Wildlife Photography. And so throughout the presentation, Alejandro will have some question periods. So feel free to unmute yourself during those, or you can also send in your questions via the chat and I will read those out to him. So with that, I'll pass it over to you, Alejandro. Amazing. Thank you so much, Nicole. And thank you to the, the Watersheds Canada team. It's, it's really a, an honor, a pleasure to be here speaking to basically the community I grew up with. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on myself. I am from Ottawa. Uh, spent many, many years of my life there, uh, photographing a lot of wildlife there as well. Um, so I'm very excited to be talking about this today. Um, now, let's actually get into real uh, presentation. So um, I'm just going to share my screen, uh, if that's okay. If that's right, Nicole. I'll take that as a yes. All right. Um, can, can you all see? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Amazing. <clears throat> so again, welcome so much. Uh, welcome to this, uh, this presentation about wildlife photography near you, finding beautiful animals in your own backyard. Um, why, why did I put on this presentation? Um, well, mainly because scrolling through Instagram or watching documentaries on TV may convince you that you need to visit far off exotic places to capture stunning photos of wildlife. I mean, who doesn't remember, you know, maybe watching a bunch of documentaries where you saw, you know, a cheetah chasing a little gazelle and ending up getting it being, like, oh, wow, I want to capture those photos. And I feel like at some point we started to kind of think that those were the kind of photo, the only photos that were worth taking of animals, right? Some people tend to put those photos on a pedestal compared to animals near you. However, wildlife photography is not always about photographing rare species. This art, <clears throat> in my opinion, is about capturing moments that evoke emotion in the viewer. 
The subject can be an animal as rare as a snow leopard in the Himalayas or as common as a gull in your neighborhood pond. And, you know, while is it, it is true that you can capture amazing shots in these faraway places, it does not mean that you cannot get equal or even better photos close to home. In fact, photographing wildlife near you has unique benefits with which foreign locations cannot compete. Um, and to give you a sense of things, the contents of this conversation that we're going to have today kind of overlap with a previous blog article I wrote for my, for my website, apcwildlife.com. Uh, and it was titled, Five Reasons Why You Don't Need to Travel to Be a Great Wildlife Photographer. So if you're interested, please feel free to go over there and check it out. It might have some stuff that is quite new or different compared to this presentation. <clears throat> I'm just going to go to the next slide here. I um, already did a bit of a background on me, but as I said, I'm the founder of APC Wildlife Photography, uh, a wildlife photography education website. Um, I'm also the marketing associate at Mongabay, which is an environmental news platform. And kind of the connection to Watersheds Canada here is that I used to work at Ottawa Riverkeeper, a local NGO that worked on protecting the Ottawa River watershed. Um, and previous to that, uh, I also did my MSc in conservation at the University of Oxford here in the UK, where I am now. Um, and also, maybe at this point, I just want to give a special thank you again to Watersheds Canada, but specifically um, to Monica Seidel, who kind of set this whole, whole thing up. Uh, she used to be a, a board member with me at Emerging Leaders for Biodiversity, and I also see a few of our colleagues on here too. Hello, Meredith. So thank you so much uh, for coming. Anyhow. On to the next slide. So, you know, I, I'm definitely not knocking travel, travel wildlife photography because, you know, going to amazing places to photograph species that you don't usually see can be incredible. You know, for instance, just this past year, um, I've gone to Romania where I photographed this uh, great white pelican in the Danube Delta. I also went to Colombia where I photographed this sword-billed hummingbird, which to be honest, I never saw a beak like this in the animal kingdom. <laughs> and I was very excited to see it. Um, and uh, I also just recently returned from Spain, where I photographed in the endangered Iberian lynx, of which there are only, I think, 12 to 1300 left in the world. And it's an endemic species to Spain. Um, and sorry, Spain and Portugal. Um, however, you know, I think there are many, many benefits to shooting locally, you know, but why? Why should we shoot, you know, in our neighborhoods? Why should we do that? And that's exactly what we're going to explore today. Um, and feel free to, you know, as if you have any questions, pop them in the chat, we can discuss them afterwards, but there will be question periods uh, during this conversation um, for us to kind of get things going. Uh, so that leads me to my first question. What species do you see near you regularly? And feel free to unmute or write in the chat as you wish. Give it a second in case anyone wants to speak up or else I'm gonna start picking on people. <laughs> Red-winged blackbirds, amazing. Deer, Kai, okay, dang, there's some good ones here. Oof. Yeah, that, that's that's awesome, yep, nice, deer. Loons, oh, oh, we see a cottage person out there if you've seen loons. Porcupine, wild turkey, very nice. Turtles, okay, <laughs> that's that's super exciting. Um, Man, that's that's incredible. So, you know, luckily, our buildings, backyards, and local parks have become hotspots for several species of birds, mammals, reptiles, and more. And these animals have learned to live with us, which is like excellent news if you're looking to get award-winning wildlife shots. Um, for instance, near my home in Ottawa, we see a lot of the species that people are mentioning in the chat, such as mallards, sparrows, raccoons, coyotes, rabbits, deer, turkey vultures, red-tailed hawks, etc. All of these species can be found just by walking outside. And these common species can often be overlooked and considered boring despite making wonderful subjects. I mean, how often do we pe hear people, you know, hate on mallards <laughs> or even pigeons, right? Just because they're so common. But realistically, they can make some excellent subjects and some great photos for you to hang on your wall or show online. So, you know, this is fantastic for you if you want to photograph wildlife without having to travel far because you just need to walk outside. Um, sure. Okay. On to next slide. Another huge part of why uh, photographs, photographing species locally has uh, excellent benefits is because the subjects tend to be more cooperative. Because they grow up, they raise their young, they, they feed around humans constantly, they're more accustomed to us. And because of that, they're, they're willing to exhibit a lot more of their natural behavior in front of us. 
Whereas, you know, contrast that with, uh, let's say you try to get close to a great blue heron in, in, in the middle of Toronto, in the middle of Ottawa, you know, any kind of big city, it usually will be relatively easy. However, if you go out into the countryside, you know, you won't be able to get within 100 meters of that animal. So these are kind of things to, to keep in mind. Um, so the, the photo that I'm showing here is of an Eastern Phoebe. And this Phoebe was <laughs> uh, nesting right underneath a bridge. So I got to see the development of this Phoebe and its partner, as well as its chicks and everything, because it was so accustomed to people. It was used to the sound of cars. It was used to people walking over the bridge. So that really makes it easy and kind of predictable to understand what your animals are doing. Um, and maybe to nail down a bit more is when you get out there with cooperative subjects, they become more accustomed to you sometimes as an individual rather than just as a person, as an, a person within the masses. Because, you know, animals are much smarter than we give them credit for. Um, so I've noticed you know, some animals I spend a lot of time with will be very tolerant of me, but they won't be tolerant of other people. And there's no greater joy, in my opinion, than being able to photograph an animal that is that does not care about what you are doing at all. It goes about its life. It is not pressured. It does not feel scared. It just goes about feeding. It goes about flying around. It goes about running around, playing, et cetera. These are the moments that we kind of look for. And with local subjects, they are much easier to come by. Fantastic. Another great thing is that when you photograph locally, you save more money. You know, regardless of who you are, traveling to photograph wildlife will always be more expensive than staying local. Even if you travel to another province or city, it will cost you more than if you shoot the robins, for example, at your local park. Consider the travel expenses other than plane ticket or gas for your car. Those add up so quickly. Food, lodging, and, you know, tickets to national parks if you decide to go out to Western Canada. Um, by its nature, you know, wildlife photography is already very expensive compared to other hobbies due to the cost of cameras, lenses, and accessories. Therefore, travel adds yet another cost that can make it even more unaffordable for many people. That's not to say that all forms of wildlife photography are unaffordable, because, you know, nowadays with the way smartphones have progressed, and especially if you're sh shooting local wildlife that you can get close to, sometimes you can actually get some really cool images. It's kind of crucial to understand also that wildlife photographers that travel across the world on assignments are often compensated for their time and expenses. So, you know, it's not really a fair comparison to compare yourself, you know, for instance, if you're just a hobby photographer to someone who their whole entire life and income depends on that, right? So, you know, currently, this is not my reality. And I know probably for most people on this call, it's it's not theirs either. Or actually, in fact, most wildlife photographers, I, I'm almost, I'm willing to almost bet my house on it. <laughs> they don't make most of their income from it. They just love the art and they just want to pursue it. Um, fantastic. And just <laughs> want to point out here, um, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the species, you'll see the, the city I took the photo in and also kind of the travel time it took. Um, I found a little bit funny because I, I, I was going to put a 10 minute walk, but I was like, I don't think it, it really captures the essence of everything I had to do. <laughs> so there was a five minute walk on regular land. And then I had to wait for five minutes through a river to get to this mink. Um, another big benefit of photographing local wildlife is that you save time. OK, uh, you know, money is one part of the equation, but let's let's give an example. Right. If I want to just walk out of my house and go photograph some geese right now, I could be there in five minutes. However, um, when I when I just went to Spain recently, think of all the time you have to invest into that. You have to get to the airport. You have to wait at the airport. You have to take a flight. Then you have to get to your accommodation, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas during that time, you could have photographed, you know, geese, you know, 10 times, right? <laughs> 10 different times rather than, than doing that. I'm, obviously, I'm exaggerating with 10 times, but, you know, you, you, you get the point. You're able to, I guess, maximize your time more efficiently. Um, and also because when you go to foreign places to photograph uh, species, you don't know where they are because those places are not what you're used to. Whereas, you know, back home, you have more or less a good lay of the land. So it will take you a lot less time to find the, the, the subjects that you want to put in your viewfinder. Um, so that's another thing to, to, to keep in mind. 
Um, now, the next thing, and this is something that I think really connects well with uh, the mission of Watersheds Canada, is that when you photograph wildlife locally, you help the environment, okay? You know, even before I was a wildlife photographer, I was an environmentalist, I care very much about the environment. Um, and of course, you always have to make trade-offs in life. But regardless, if you take a car, plane, or another form of transportation, your decision to travel will inevitably release more pollution into the atmosphere. In turn, this further exacerbates the global climate crisis, right? You know, I don't want to get too deep into it, but climate change is no joke. And, you know, I think each person is able to kind of make their own little contribution, even if it just means traveling a little less or whatever. But again, it comes down to personal a choice. So, you know, whatever makes sense for you, that's that's what I would recommend. Um, I think a decision to stay close to home could be a fantastic way for someone to do their part for the planet, planet because after all, there's only one. Um, but that said, I'm not telling anyone not to travel. In fact, I love traveling. <laughs> I love traveling. Um, but instead, I think each person has to make decisions they agree with morally. Um, as an example, when I lived in Ottawa, uh, during a regular work week, I would make a conscious effort to shoot wildlife in and around my neighborhood. Uh, I would often walk or drive a maximum of 15 to 20 minutes. And in fact, I think uh, um, the deer in this photo was probably one of the farthest places I would drive during uh, a regular weekday. Um, however, on the odd weekend, I would make a trip farther out. And furthermore, a few times throughout the year, I would try to travel uh, somewhere much farther. As I mentioned, you know, this year, for instance, has been Romania, Spain, Colombia. Um, but also for personal reasons, but yeah. <laughs> um, but anyways, by limiting your travel, you can control how much you pollute the environment and make decisions that work for you. It's not a one size fits all approach. So I encourage you to consider what works best for your lifestyle and priorities. Um, now, I want to kind of get to this next part. You know, I kind of explained a little bit about the benefits of staying local, but I really want to kind of help transmit the experience of what you know, I feel in the field and kind of what kind of behind the scenes of story is behind these photos. Um, I know some people are fans of, you know, naming animals. I, for some reason, I just can't do it. But this is a heron that I grew to know very, very well over a period of probably a year and a half. Okay. Um, this person-ish, <laughs> this subject uh, lived close to my home and I would see it several times a week. I was just like clockwork. I knew where it was going to be. And it, over time, I was able to get closer and closer and closer um, to the point where I was able to make, have some of the best encounters that I've ever had with any animal, regardless of country I've lived in. You know, to be honest, I mean, I don't live in Ottawa anymore. And apart from my family and friends, you know, this heron and the moments I spent with this, with this animal, in the early mornings are some of my fondest memories. And that's because, you know, this, this heron became an essential part of my routine. I knew exactly where it was anytime. And, you know, over time, it became more comfortable with me and my presence to the point where I was able to get photos such as this one. Um, you know, and even though I, I obviously I like headshots, I like getting more contextual images, which kind of leads me to the next one. This heron would flit around my neighborhood from the river to the stormwater pond and back. Uh, so I was able to kind of see it in different locations. Um, I know a lot of people aren't really fans of having, you know, human elements in photos. But for me, it's one of the things I love the most. So if I can find a way to put a human element such as the stormwater drain into a photo and make it look, um, make it to my liking, I will do it. Um, so I would often watch this heron just hanging out on this little surface here in front of the, the stormwater drain, um, either preening or, you know, catching fish that would come too close. And, you know, those kind of moments for me are indescribable. Um, and, you know, I, I, in, after the next slide, I have another question for everyone. Um, and again, I, I would encourage people to unmute if they would like to, or if you don't feel comfortable with that, please feel free to drop something in the chat. Um, so anyways, this kind of also gives you an idea of the environment of the animal, right? Not just, okay, this is a headshot. We don't know exactly where it is. This kind of gives you an idea of kind of how local wildlife has to adapt to humanity, right? You know, you, you, you go out to, to um, 
let's say you go to the Serengeti to photograph cheetahs or something like that. It's not going to be the same because most of the photos you see out there is just a cheetah chasing gazelle. What do you get? Yellow grass, etc. Whereas when you actually get to photograph animals that really live close to people, you can have some incredible moments where you tell the story of not only the animal, but also its adaptation to us, right? Imagine many, many years ago, none of our human constructions existed. And now the, some of these animals have actually managed to thrive. So I think that's a very beautiful part of it. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, uh, this, this is probably one of my favorite photos I ever took, uh, not only this animal, but in general. Um, I think part of it is because you know, I actually get to capture it in environment when it's about to strike a fish, but also because of, uh, you know, I don't think many people often talk about it, but the physical toll that wildlife photography can have on you, um, you, you know, for this photo, just to give you an idea of what happened, um, I had been watching the heron from the bank quite a bit, and I realized, hey, you know what, I might be able to get a better photo if I get in the rapids <laughs> where it's hunting, yes, don't worry. My mother has laughed at me enough. <laughs> I'm sure some people are saying, hey, this guy's crazy. Um, it's kind of weird not seeing people's faces. But, but anyways, I got in the middle of the rapids. And you know what? I kept on trying different compositions. But I was like, hmm, this is not exactly the photo I want. Especially, I felt like I wasn't low enough. So what I actually had to do, and this was very uncomfortable, was kneel down in the middle of the river lean over one of these rocks you see here and <laughs> hold out the camera in front of me kind of like this which for anyone who's ever held a camera before you understand is not a very stable position whatsoever it is very very uncomfortable and some of these rocks are very jagged um but i feel like the experience totally paid off because i got to be in a place where i got the photograph i wanted i was with probably my favorite animal at the time and at the same time, it was not bothered by me whatsoever. You know, it was not bothered me by whatsoever. But we'll talk about that um, in a second. Now, I just want to uh, want to open up the chat for a second um, to see if anyone ha would like to share any experience that they've had with animals locally um, that they'd be interested in talking about. It could be wh wherever you'd like. You can write it in the chat or you can unmute. I'd be happy to, to hear from people. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Watersheds Canada, Nicole, you guys would have to um, unmute people, but please feel free to speak up, anybody. I have two beavers that live in my local stormwater pond. I haven't captured a photo of them yet, but I'm hoping to in the future. Oh, no way. That's, that's, that's incredible. Um, and would you say you see them quite often? Yes, I walk almost every evening and they're there most days. So that's pretty cool. That's, that's, that's sick. <laughs> that's incredible. Um, thank you for sharing. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to share? Um, I see some of my friends here, so I, I do not mind picking on you guys. <laughs> so Alejandro, you, you already know this, but I, I recently found there's a stormwater pond I visit frequently. Um, and recently it's kind of become a uh, gathering ground for egrets. Wow. Um, so I've been there a few times and there will be a tree that's literally there are 30, 35 egrets in one tree at one time. That's like a really cool thing to see. Yeah, man, you're, you're speaking my language. I mean, 35 egrets in a tree, that's that's unheard of. Um, and, you know, for, for anyone that isn't aware, you know, great egrets were not super common in Ontario, I don't know, 20 years ago. So they've kind of been expanding their range northwards. And, you know, it's awesome to see that, you know, at the stormwater pond that Mark mentions, like they're, they're have, they have that kind of congregation there. So I think we're, we're very lucky to have that kind of thing. Um, would you like to say anything else about that, Mark? I saw you unmuted. No, I think I think that's good. I mean, I have lots of stormwater pond stories, but I'll leave it at just that. <laughs> no, thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to read out uh, what Beth said in the chat. She said that um, I would love to capture birds in flight. We have ravens, which are quite the acrobats. That that that's pretty that's pretty cool. Um, you know, I've usually only been exposed mostly to crows. I think ravens tend to be a little more aloof. Uh, at, at least where I've where I've lived, they usually tend to be, let's say, farther out in the countryside. But you know, 
when you finally see a raven like it's it's incredible because they're like almost double the size of crows right like there's no mistaking it once you see them side by side um so thank you so much for for sharing that beth um if anyone else would like to to share please feel free lots of bird species on my card fair Okay, Hayden. Hayden is, uh, has just written in the chat that there are lots of bird species at his cottage and that his favorite is the great blue heron. Well, um, thank you so much for saying that because I love great blue herons too, if you didn't <laughs> realize. <laughs> so that, that that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'll give maybe one more minute in case anyone else would like to say anything. Okay, great. Well, thank you for everyone who uh, who contributed. Um, <clears throat> let's move on to the next part. Um, so just to give you a sense of things, <laughs> uh, this is kind of like for me, kind of closing the loop for this story. Uh, I personally don't think this is the best photo I've ever taken, but I do think it works very well to tell the story that animals will literally live under, above, beneath, wherever they need to in order to survive. And they become sometimes very comfortable with us, depending on the species. So this is the same heron I've been photographing forever. Uh, this is, I, to, <laughs> to put things in perspective, I've literally been maybe five, 10 feet away from it, and it's just been basically sleeping. Um, but, you know, this is the bridge. This is where the Phoebes were. This is where some pigeons were nesting. So wildlife, you know, finds a way. Um, kind of sound like Jurassic Park there. But anyways. <laughs> um, so now let's talk a bit about, you know, how to photograph local wildlife. We've, you know, you don't have to worry. I'm not going to get into specifics about gear or anything. More, I just want to focus on the experience because I understand that gear can be a very specific thing whether you have a DSLR, a mirrorless camera, a bridge, a smartphone, et cetera, the experience is gonna to be totally different. So if you would like to talk about specifics, we, you, can, you can message me privately and we can have a discussion about that. But right here, I just wanna make sure that everyone has a chance to understand how to photograph and how to get close to local wildlife. Um, by the way, this photo, I think this is my only encounter ever with the turkey vulture that wasn't super high up in the air. And I got very, very lucky. Um, Here's a pro tip. If you want to find turkey vultures, look for areas where, look for big lakes where the, the water levels have dropped a lot and a lot of dead fish show up. Boom, turkey vultures. So something to keep in mind. Um, so tip number one would be go outside as much as possible. Um, the more times you go outside, the higher your chances will be of actually finding something. And at the same time, you will also become more accustomed with the landscape around you, the behavior of species, et cetera. Second tip, and this is something I don't really see, like in my research, I don't really see many people uh, advertising this, which is speak to people, speak to your neighbors, speak to birders, speak to people in parks, to, you know, share your stories. Hey, oh, I just saw a Canada goose over here. I saw a mockingbird here. And you know what? Maybe people will reciprocate and tell you, hey, I saw one over here. You know, you don't know how many times I've been out to local parks. People have seen me with my gear and they've asked me, oh, you know, are you a photographer? Oh yeah, well, actually I saw a beaver over this way. Maybe you can go get it. So people, if you are friendly, and of course, if they're friendly too, will be very willing to like kind of help you find um, find animals, kind of give you a better understanding of the landscape, etc. Um, so sometimes just asking people, hey, do you know where, if there are deer in this area, like that can be an excellent way to do it. Um, in fact, when I used to live in Italy, you know, I had no idea about the landscape there. I just went to a local restaurant in the mountains and asked, hey, where can I find this species of sheep? And <laughs> they they helped me out. Um, but anyways, speak to people. I cannot uh, un understate that. Third, observe behavior. The more time you spend just watching an animal from a distance before trying to photograph it, the better. Because you will understand its habits. And sometimes, like, similar to humans, animals are creatures of habit. So, example, a Phoebe, okay? A Phoebe will sit on, an Eastern Phoebe will sit on one branch. It'll fly up in the air to catch a, uh, an insect and they'll come back down to the same branch, okay? <laughs> and that's kind of their hunting strategy. And then at the same time, they will fly from that branch back to the nest if they're feeding, um, they're feeding, their, feeding their chicks. So there are many, many types of behavior that, that you can observe. Same as 
this Canada goose on screen or mallards, actually a few species of waterfowl, if they dunk their head under the water several times, what's going to happen? They're going to flap <laughs> because that's their way of stretching their wings, drying off, etc. So there are ways to kind of uh, observe behavior and also get ready to predict it so you're able to photograph the things that you want to see. Fourth, be patient. Okay. <laughs> Rome wasn't built in a day and neither was <laughs> your wildlife photography journey. I started back in 2017. And frankly, when I look back at some of the photos I took back then, I think they are absolute garbage. However, <laughs> they got me where I am today. So you know, wildlife photography is not overnight. It's not an overnight thing. It's something that you have to practice over and over on yourself. You have to go out every single, well, not every single day, as much as your schedule allows in order to keep improving. And at the same time, when you are in the field, you have to be patient because there are some times where you might have to wait and wait and wait for an animal to show up or for it to do the behavior uh, that you're waiting for. Um, I shared earlier a, a picture of a belted kingfisher. I think I was waiting probably maybe, it was a five minute walk away from my house, but I was waiting in, in, in these reeds hidden for maybe two hours for it to show up. And you know that's kind of like on the short end of the waiting game. So sometimes, depending on the species, you may have to wait much longer. Um, so that's just patience. Patience is key. Um, one of the tips I actually mentioned on my blog is uh, I, I kind of developed a technique called the, the 300 rule. <laughs> it's kind of weird, but it's okay. It, it, it might help somebody. Um, when I start to get impatient, when I'm waiting for an animal or you know waiting for something to happen, uh, I, obviously I get the urge sometimes like, you know what, forget it. I'm just going to get up and leave. But what I start doing is counting down from 300, slowly, 300, 299, 298, et cetera. And sometimes by the time I get to 200, I might have even forgotten about counting and I'm re-engaged or something might have happened already. So sometimes trying to trick yourself into waiting more, being more patient can be an excellent thing that can pay off. And um, sometimes just staying a bit longer can also be excellent because you never know what can turn up. The other thing I'd mention is try and try again. Go out, even if one day you get no, no photos, you know, try again, even if you, you, you were almost close to getting that photo of a kingfisher, but ah, dang, it's blurry. Keep trying and trying and trying. There are so many ways that you can improve, but the easiest one is just to keep trying. Okay. So I would say, you know, don't be discouraged if things don't happen for you immediately. It just takes a lot of time and practice, you know, for every photo that I've showed in this presentation, I'm sure I have 10, even 20 blurry ones, <laughs> maybe even more, depending on the subject. So, you know, you, it's just a game of percentages and chance, and you just have to try and try again. Um, and yeah, one last thing I would say, there's rule number six, which is the golden rule, respect the animals. Animal ethics, I think, are, are key, um, you know, to a certain extent, I feel like there's a bit of misinformation or a bit of the message sometimes gets lost online when people say, oh, you know, you can never disturb an animal, et cetera, or else, you know, you're canceled. But let, let's try to be kind. We're all human here. OK, I think the most important thing for me is if your intent is to not disturb an animal, but it happens to get flushed by accident, that's fine. That's that's normal. That's part of the I mean, it's not fine because it leaves. But, you know, your intent was never to harm it, right? Your intent was never to, oh, I'm going to keep pushing my luck because I'm greedy. But sometimes these things happen, especially if it's early on. You know, if it's early on, you're not too sure how close you can get to an animal. And it becomes even more complex because every single species is different, you know? And sorry, not every single species, every single individual. This great egret that you see on screen might be different from its cousin right beside it. So you might be able to get within five feet of this animal, but you can't get within, I don't know, a kilometer of the other. I'm exaggerating, but it's th these are nuances and uh, uh, animals have personalities just as much as people. So some might like more personal space than others. Um, and it's something, something that, you know, you just have to learn along the way. Um, and on my blog, I have a, a few different tutorials about how to photograph uh, great blue herons, shorebirds, and there's going to be a few others coming out soon. So um, I think uh, those tips can be quite helpful for some people here. Um, great. Then, you know, apart from saying thank you right now, I think 
I just want to close on this thought. You know, travel can be a fantastic way to see new places in wildlife. However, there are many factors to consider before you book a trip to that exotic location. Among these are the expense, finding species in a foreign environment, the environmental impact, and buying new camera gear as an alternative. Um, let me be clear. I will never tell anyone not to travel because I do a lot of it myself. Um, but I think it's important to ask yourself, is it worth it right now? You know, I think 100% you should travel, but ask yourself, is it worth it? You know, um, because a lot of times you can have these incredible wildlife experiences right at your doorstep. Um, and, you know, before you get caught up in the travel FOMO on Instagram of people who have, you know, 10,000, 20,000 followers, you know, remember one thing, um, as long as you have a decent camera and lens, which today could even be a smartphone, you can take epic wildlife photographs just by walking outside. You have pigeons, you have ducks, you have sparrows, even rats, even if people are scared of them in your neighborhood that can surprise you. And, you know, you don't, you realize you don't really need to visit the Serengeti or the Amazon to capture incredible moments in nature. Um, so I would say, you know, weigh the option of improving your skills first before considering spending hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on wildlife photography trips. That way, when the time comes to take that once in a lifetime trip to Alaska, you'll be ready for the shot because you'll have photographed sparrows, mallards, <laughs> and foxes, or whatever else you find in your neighborhood as much as possible. So thank you so much to Watersheds Canada, and thank you so much to you, the wonderful audience, um, and I'm happy to, to hear anybody's questions. Thanks, Alejandro. That was a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, just before we get started in the questions, I wanted to let everyone know about our survey. So Jane's just going to quickly drop a link to our survey in the chat. And if you wouldn't mind to please take a moment to let us know if you enjoyed the webinar, if you have any recommendations, and if there's any topics that you're interested in in the future, we greatly appreciate that. Um, so now if you have any questions, you can also type them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Great. And I can right. see one here. Um, yeah, go ahead, sorry. It just says from Carol, can you recommend a good camera for beginners? I'm using an iPhone, which doesn't take great photos. Hey, uh, Carol, thank you so much for the question. Um, that, I mean, I think that's a little bit more of a tricky question uh, just because every person is different. Um, you know, choosing a camera can depend on many things such as, you know, your budget. It can depend on the weight that you want to have. Uh, that you want to carry, should I say, depend on what subjects you're shooting. So, you know, um, I, I would recommend if you want to have that conversation, like 100% get in touch with me and we can, you know, talk about something that that works for you. Um, but I, I definitely understand kind of sometimes the limitations of iPhones. Uh, and there might be actually some really good affordable options that might be um, that, 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 that might work for you. So please get, get in touch with me uh, privately. And we can we can discuss your situation. I'd love to. Okay, let's see. We have a question from Linda. Uh, did I use a tripod for most of the photos I showed? Um, no, let's, to be honest, I'm not sure if I use a tripod for any. Like, let me pull up the, the presentation. Can you see? I think you can, yeah. Um, so no tripod here, no tripod there, no tripod there. No tripod. I'm trying to see if, yeah, I don't think any of these photos, no. I, oh, this one I use a tripod for. This one I did. Uh, I was at a hide for this. So yeah, I, I use a tripod for this one, but the other ones were were just uh, hand holding. Um, I think, uh, I'm just gonna, man, zoom is a little bit frustrating. Um, I think when it comes to hand holding versus tripod, you know, if I could give some tips as to how to get photographs without having to, you know, use a tripod, because, you know, tripods can sometimes, you know, limit your movement so much is just try to have a very sturdy posture, <laughs> kind of get your elbows tucked into your chest, keep your, your, your forehead glued to the camera. If I had my camera here, I would show you how. <laughs> um, and just if you, one thing that's really helped me a lot is just trying to find support in nature, lean against a tree, get on the ground, because if you're on the ground, you, you won't shake as much, you know, lean against the rock, whatever is necessary in order to kind of um, get that support. Um, but tripods are very useful. 
and can help you get very sharp photos. Um, but you know, they come with trade-offs, sharp photos, <laughs> lower shutter speeds, but you, uh, you can't move as much, right? Um, fantastic. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad you, you think so, Linda, because, you know, tripods are not necessary to take awesome photos. You just have to kind of know yourself and know your gear. And again, if anyone wants to have a conversation about that, please feel free to, to message me on, on Instagram or, or LinkedIn or wherever you like. <clears throat> um, I see a question here from Juana Bro. Uh, she's asking, what are some of the challenges of photographing locally? That's, that's a very tough question. Um, I think similar to, to anything, I mean, sometimes it can be frustrating, uh, maybe photographing the same animals over and over, um, especially if you have access to Instagram or other social media where you're constantly comparing yourself to people. But I think over time, those are things you kind of grow out of. Um, the Another thing I would say that can be a challenge locally is sometimes you don't have access to some places that you would like to, you know, let's say if, it, if you're trying to, you know, there's like a family of foxes that breeds in this area, but it happens to be private property, <laughs> you know, good luck, <laughs> good, good luck doing that without breaking, a, breaking the law or having a really good relationship with the, with the landowners. Um, but to be honest, I would say there aren't really that many downsides to photographing locally. Oh, here's one I remembered actually, one that a lot of my friends uh, mentioned, uh, often, which is if you photograph in public spaces or local parks and you are you are looking to, to take photos of animals, good luck because uh, dogs and people can easily scare off your animals. Um, so that's a challenge that I deal with on a regular, but <clears throat> the good thing is that those animals are used to people. So even if they get scared off, they'll usually come back, but it can be very frustrating when you're laying there taking photos of a heron someone very loud or a car that's very noisy or someone diving in the water just scares it. But, um, you know, it, it'll come back. So, you know, that's the benefit of, of being with a uh, local species. Um, here's a question from Meredith Meeker. Digital cameras give you so many photos, some that are almost identical. Any tips to save time when you are going through? That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, and that's a, a struggle I deal with all the time. <clears throat> I think it takes time uh, and it really depends on personality. I, for instance, tend to be someone who suffers from decision paralysis quite often. Uh, so what I've tried to do to counteract that is try to remove the emotional attachment I have to images, some, to, to images sometimes. Um, so if I fully know it's a photo that I don't think is good, I will always delete it. I will always try to delete it. Um, if I see a blurry photo, I will 99% of the time delete it unless it has some sort of sentimental value-ish. Um, and then if I have a whole bunch of photos that look the same, but I've already removed all the blurry ones, I look at them and say, okay, let's dig down at the composition. So um, I was sorting through some, some photos of, a uh, what's it called? I I Iberian Ibex, which is a species of wild goat that lives in Spain and uh, Portugal. Um, and I had three photos that looked almost the same, but here's one you have to be very, very critical with yourself and of what you want. Okay. So in this photo, you had, let's say the horns <laughs> of the animal like this. And in two of the photos, let's say this is their, the ear, two of the photos, the ear was touching the horns. One photo, it wasn't. It was like this. So in that case, I would just delete the ones uh, in which the ears are touching the horns and keep the one where there's more separation. Um, so that's just an example of how you would kind of apply, I guess, composition rules to kind of, or what you like as a photographer to kind of eliminate that kind of workload because yes, you end up taking hundreds, thousands of photos and you need to sort through them all. It's, it's, it's a pain. Um, so yeah, very, very good question, uh, Meredith. Um, and I assume, you know, for biologists and people who work in the fields, like, you know, it's no fun sorting through camera trap footage, especially with like the false triggers and everything. <laughs> um, great. Uh, any other questions? Here? Feel free to unmute as well. I'm perfectly happy to see people's faces or hear you talk. <laughs> I see a question here about um, what photo editing software that you use. Do you let us 
Yeah, um, good question. I I personally use Lightroom, uh, like Adobe Lightroom, which is more or less the standard in wildlife photography or in photography in general. Um, however, I I don't know if I would necessarily recommend it to everybody uh, because I mean. <laughs> uh, subscription services can be a pain. They can be an absolute pain because you you end up paying what I think Adobe charges. I can't remember. It was fifteen twenty dollars a month, which you know, like it or not, like it, those those expenses add up. Um, so you know, recently I've been you know some of my friends they use uh, on one, which I think is a lot cheaper, maybe like a one time fee, and there are even some free uh, free software versions. Um, they obviously don't offer everything that Adobe Lightroom offers, um, but you know, if, if it doesn't fit within your budget, I would say, you know, there are ways to get there, you know, just because everyone uses Lightroom doesn't mean that's the only way that, uh, that you can, that you can do it. And I think Lightroom offers some free options too, but I'm not too familiar with the mobile stuff. Um, I just do everything on my desktop. Um, yeah. Oh, the other thing I would, what would like to mention is, you know, for a long time, noise and like very high ISOs was a big problem for photography. So like noise is like when you get that, a lot of grain in the images uh, for anyone who, you know, doesn't necessarily do a lot of photography. Um, but now you have these programs that are able to like eliminate a lot of that noise and at the same time kind of keep like the same quality. Uh, so I personally use like DXO Pure Raw. Uh, if you guys want, I can write it in the chat just so everyone <laughs> understands what we're talking about. Um, but there are also other options such as um, what's it called? Topaz Denoise and a few others. Um, so, you know, there, there, there are definitely ways to kind of improve your images if, you know, you happen to be weighed down by your gear or something like that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, some cool stuff available. Um, any other questions? Here? Hey, Alejandro, it's Carl here. Nice to, uh, I, I put my camera on, but I'm actually, it, it's not letting me, but um, nice oh, to yeah, actually yeah. sort of meet you. You know, we've been chatting in the uh, in the background a lot. Um, I, I'm sorry, I came on late, so I don't actually know everything that you went through, but I, I'd love to hear what sort of your most memorable or challenging urban wildlife experience was. Oof. Tough one, I know. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I think you missed one part where I talked about, uh, I don't know if I would call this animal my best friend, but <laughs> let me see if I can uh, pull it up again. Um, yeah, my, my apologies. I had another meeting no, no. until, until 1.30, so I had to jump on late, but. It's okay. Can everyone see this? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, I, I would say probably the most <clears throat> memorable time for me was like the year and a half or two years that I spent uh, photographing this heron just near my house. Um, just because over time, it just became so, so familiar and comfortable around me to the point where sometimes it just felt like I was hanging out with a friend. <laughs> like it was just like, I could be five feet away from it. Whereas like, it wouldn't let anyone else near it. Um, and I watched it sleep, watched it hunt. I watched it fly. I knew exactly what perches it would go to, like to just, uh kind of rest during the day um so for me I, I would say it holds quite a special place in my heart um in terms of challenging experiences i mean dang I, 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 that's that's a good question i think wildlife photography is always a challenge it is very very difficult <laughs> it does not mean you should not do it but it is very very difficult um i'd say for me the most challenging times are when you're photographing animals where you have to get very low and you have to wait for a very long time. So imagine uh, if I wanted to photograph um, any kind of plover or sandpiper, any type of shorebird, sometimes in order to, to get a good photo of them, you have to see the direction that they're going in, get ahead of them. <laughs> and then from there, you have to lay down and wait in the soaking mud and sand. Or you can do that, but also crawl, literally crawl. I mean, sometimes I, I kid you not, I have crawled maybe 50 to 100 meters in the sand just to get to um, just to get to 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 a flock of sandpipers. Um, and I would say that is probably some of the most challenging stuff because it is very uncomfortable physically. And it's very taxing and, you know, you never think of wildlife photography kind of as something that's super active, but man, 
sometimes these photos require that that effort. Um, and I mean, lots of patience. That that is that is for sure. <clears throat> I'd also say um, photographing deer, man, they are very very difficult to find. <clears throat> Sorry to get good photos of in Ottawa. Um, one time I had to crawl like forty five minutes before sunrise just to get close to some deer because I knew that if they saw my shape, they would run. I got there, but it was not fun. And that is probably the most challenging part of it all, dealing with the physical aspect, I'd say. Yeah, so <laughs> thanks. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Thanks for the question. Um, cool, any, any other questions? Great. Well, if there are no questions, I wanted to kind of just say that um, at APC Wildlife Photography, um, you know, I'm, we're, uh, my kind of my company is kind of going in expansion phase. Uh, so I just want to put it out there that if anyone would like to write a guest blog for the website where they talk about their wildlife experiences or anything or how they photograph wildlife in their area or anywhere else, like I, I definitely welcome that. Um, and please feel free to message me privately, uh, either on Instagram at APC Wildlife 15 or on my website, apcwildlife.com. Uh, and if, you know, anyone would like me to come and do a presentation where they work or anything, like, I'd be happy to. Um, but I really just want to thank Watersheds Canada for this opportunity. Nicole, Jane, it's, it's been wonderful being here. So thank you so much. Thanks again, Alejandro. We appreciate it. And thank you to everyone that was tuning in today. And I hope that you have a great rest of the day.